that's an introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to live up to that. First, nothing I say is legal tax or investment advice, which is always my favorite part of the presentation. Get a picture, please. Today, I'm going to talk about Deepin projects, and I'm going to start by telling you what I believe Deepin should mean, because if every good crypto talk requires that you argue about a definition. So I think Deepin projects are any sufficiently decentralized network using cryptography and or mechanism designed to ensure a client can request physical services from a set of providers. Uh, to me, this is mostly uh, telecom, energy, and transportation. Uh, but first, I'll talk about what Deepin is, then why you should care, uh, and then a little bit about how to build a Deepin project. Uh, and so in the, the telecom space, often called DY, I think uh, you know, Helium is one of the projects we invested in. Then there are other projects like, uh, obviously, Andrina. And I heard Neil gave me a, a wonderful shout out earlier today, so thank you. Uh, then Witness Chain, Xnet are other projects. Uh, decentralized energy, I think, is particularly compelling, particularly uh, Daylight. Last week, actually, we announced uh, investing in, in their project. They're building a decentralized virtual power plant. There are other interesting projects like Glow and Tesseract. Uh, and then transportation, I think, is also really compelling, and there are fewer projects building there. So if you're looking for ideas, that's a fertile ground to mine, I think. Uh, Nosh is building decentralized DoorDash, uh, Teleport, and then Demo focused on uh, mobility for cars as well. Why should you care about Deepin? Well, there are a lot more people here than there were last year. So I think a lot of people understand why they should care about Deepin. But usually the answer is some version of crowdfunding, uh, which is true to an extent. But I think there are other reasons to be interested in Deepin projects. The first being that they provide, in my opinion, the largest upgrade over existing solutions. So usually in crypto, we talk about moving from Web 2 to Web 3. In Deepin, we talk about moving from incumbent monopolies largely established in the 1900s to Web3. And that's a, a jump that I think is, is really meaningful. The second is that these are real world use cases. And when you try to explain what you do or what you're interested in to your family and friends who are not crypto people, I imagine they understand Deepin projects much more immediately. And I think that's actually quite important for onboarding the next cohort of users. And third, Deepin projects enable permissionless composability, composability and access to these sorts of services for all sorts uh, of the essential networks that run our lives, not just financial services and, and not just entertainment. Uh, so we're going to skip through some of these. And then I'm going to talk about what I think is probably the most important problem for Deepin. So if you're building a Deepin project, uh, and kind of core to my definition of Deepin is the idea of verification. Uh, and so I think there are two ways you can kind of model one of these networks. The first being where the client interacts directly with a service provider. Uh, and in this paradigm, it doesn't really matter that much or matters less whether or not you're able to correctly verify the service in a decentralized way. Why? Well, because the client can observe that they're not receiving the service directly from the provider and then just decide not to stop, uh, decide to stop transacting with the provider. In this context, you also uh, don't necessarily need to distribute a token to subsidize the growth of the network because the client is interacting directly with the service provider. Uh, there's a much more fruitful and I think common network design, which is the client talks to a network uh, and then that network figures out which service provider should uh, provide the service to the client. In DeFi, this is often called peer-to-pool. Uh, I, I call this client to network as kind of the, the architecture here. So w why do people do this? Well, first you do this because it's much easier to provide a token subsidy to build a network effect early on. Uh, if you give tokens to the providers for every successful time they serve a client. Uh, now that creates a really interesting problem. That problem is called self-dealing, where the provider pretends to also be the client so they can serve themselves and extract a token reward, which if uh, you don't solve that problem, then you end up uh, wasting your token reward. And so decentralized verification is, is quite important, I think, because you need to be able to ensure uh, the providers are not self-dealing and also to be able to adjudicate conflicts between the client and the provider. If the client and the provider disagree as to whether the service was correctly provided, whether you know, on, on dawn my packet was routed or on daylight my energy was delivered, uh, you need some way to prove that to the network because the payments are all facilitated by the network. They're not made directly from the client to the provider. Uh, and so if you are interacting in a, a network architecture that is client to network, the service provider has to be able to prove that they correctly provided the service to the network itself. Uh, and so I, you know, th this matters for a couple of the reasons I was just talking about. Uh, I think the most important of these, or the one that gets talked about most, is uh, bootstrapping supply with token rewards. But I would like more people to talk about uh, how decentralized verification enables permissionless innovation and composability. I would argue a lot of the crypto apps that have true product market fit 
do so because they allow anyone anywhere in the world to participate and to propose new structures for how we operate society. And that to me is a lot more interesting than crowdfunding, at least me personally. Uh, so let's talk about verification approaches. One of the reasons I think DPIN should be very focused on physical services uh, is because of this verification question. Another way of framing what is DPIN is they are crypto networks that can't be verified computationally, that are not digital. So if you have something like a payment or a smart contract platform or a DeFi protocol that has a virtual machine abstraction and you can form consensus over those state changes or you can create a succinct proof that that computation was executed correctly. And for pretty much any time you're able to represent something in that, in that way, consensus or succinct proofs are a better approach uh, than what I'm going to tell you about for, for DFIN. <laughs> so another way of framing what projects are DPIN and what are not, anything that is computational or purely computational, really, at least in my opinion, ought not to be classified as, as DPIN. For truly physical services, you can't prove state over the physical world in a digital context. You're basically back to the Oracle problem. Uh, it's a very well-known problem. And so why is this important in a DPIN context? Well, it's important because you want to exploit the structure of the physical service that you're offering to do better than simply having to solve the Oracle problem. And so if you can't do consensus, you can't do proofs, well, I, I would posit that uh, either uh, trusted hardware, which I'm not going to talk about as much because it's more straightforward, or random sampling uh, are the best approaches to solving verification for a DPIN project. So what is random sampling? This is a, an approach that was inspired by a number of projects, mostly in a networking context, namely Helium, NIM, Orchid, and, and Filecoin. Filecoin is focused on, on storage, obviously. Uh, they don't form consensus. They generate measurement requests, which are routed towards service providers. If the service provider correctly responds to the measurement request, and that request hashes beyond some threshold, then they receive a reward akin to a block reward. If the measurement request fails, uh, then that service provider is, is slashed, either in reputation or in stake, depending on how the, the system is implemented. You don't necessarily have to implement slashing as well. Most proof of stake chains actually don't implement slashing to begin with. That's a, a different discussion. Uh, the key component of this is you assume that service providers cannot distinguish between normal user requests, which you want to subsidize. That's the reason you have the token. You want to provide a subsidy to create a strong network effect when there are fewer participants early on in the network's life. Uh, the important component is you can't distinguish between a real user request and a measurement request. Because if you can, the provider will only respond to the measurement request, not to user requests. And then they will self-deal to extract rewards from the network. This is actually, I think, the hardest part. So if you're interested in this or working on a solution to it, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. The challenge is here, how does the measurement request get created and sent without anyone knowing? Uh, if someone who is measuring the service providers knows that they're about to generate one of these, these challenges, could they uh, provide advance warning to the service providers that they're about to get a measurement request and then split the reward between the service provider and the challenger? So in some way, you have to either separate out economically the challenger and the service provider or you have to prevent the challenger from knowing they're generating a, a measurement request, which I think is possible cryptographically, but is, is very complicated and usually domain specific. And there's also the question of how do you set the difficulty threshold uh, to balance a reduction in self-dealing with a higher cost of verification. So the more measurement requests, the more challenges you generate, the less useful work is actually happening in your network. And the more often you measure, uh, you can reduce the amount of, of fraud or spoofing or, or self-dealing in the network, but sometimes increasing the cost of verification is actually, uh, it, it does not balance out against the reduction in fraud or in self-dealing or in spoofing that you might get from the network itself. And so to, to model that is usually specific to the DPIN project and relatively complicated. Uh, and then there are, there are, I think, cryptographic solutions to a lot of these problems, but again, that is uh, an exercise left to the reader, let's say. So hopefully I've motivated for you why DPIN should be defined largely around physical services, not computational services. I love decentralized cloud projects. I think they're interesting. We've been, you know, worked with a number of them. I don't think they should be called DPIN projects in this context because they can be verified purely computationally. I think you should care about DPIN. There are a lot of people in the audience, which is, which is wonderful, uh, because it provides, in my opinion, the largest upgrade over the existing status quo. Moving from incumbent monopolies in the US and in many developing countries, no existing infrastructure to a decentralized version, I, I think is an incredible opportunity. And then how should you think about building DeepIn projects? Well, I would encourage you to consider deeply how you're going to verify your physical service. 
Uh, and if that's something you're more interested in talking about, then I would love to chat with you afterwards. That's my talk, and I think we have a few minutes for questions, so I'm happy to take them. So you're asking about uh, like physically co-located uh, CDNs, for example, or something. Yes, I, I think there's there's obviously nuance to this. I'm trying to create a bright line, but you know, in, in anything there is not. Uh, most of the projects that are, in my opinion, decentralized cloud services that are often lumped into the deep in category are too expensive to verify with consensus or with succinct proofs, which is why they adopt a verification method that looks more like the random sampling method I was proposing and why they are often called deep in projects. So hopefully that kind of explains the nomenclature disagreement and crypto loves arguing about definitions, so I'm sure it will not be solved today. Uh, I used to be very negative about trusted hardware. Uh, I think trusted hardware is actually a very good solution. Uh, most projects can start with trusted hardware where you uh, embed signing keys into all of the, assuming you're building a network that you want to distribute physical devices, and that's part of uh, bootstrapping the supply side of the network. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine to embed signing keys in all of the devices you manufacture, whitelist them, sell those devices, and then only accept uh, requests or, or service provision from those devices. Now that obviously doesn't scale or decentralize in the long term because then you have you know, a whitelist through governance for who can participate, and you're also trusting the manufacturer of the hardware. But in many cases, I think that is the correct initial uh, way to, to distribute the, the uh, protocol and go to market because one of the big hairy questions which I have not talked about is how you find demand side interest for deep in projects. And I, uh, I do think it's probably better to start with something that is good as opposed to wait for something that is perfect. Neil. <laughs> yes, uh, so DGEN is Decentraliz Decentralized uh, Generative Electricity Networks. Uh, so basically decentralized energy, but I think the name is much more fun. Uh, so I used to work uh, for Protocol Labs, and, and I did research there. One of the other projects in the group was literally called uh, the Decentralized Energy Project, and so I got more interested a couple of years ago. Uh, the reasons I think decentralized energy are interesting, first, there are very few traditional industries where they care about decentralization, and they've never heard of crypto before. So there's someone else who works on our American Dynamism team who literally wrote a blog post called Decentralized Energy that has nothing to do with crypto. That is purely about the fact that it's very hard to add new devices uh, to the American energy grid because the interconnect delays are so long. And so when there is obvious interest in decentralization from a traditional industry uh, and they're not caring about crypto, that seems like an interesting opportunity to provide decentralization uh, to them. Second, I, I'm you know, very personally interested in electricity uh, grids. I think they're kind of a fascinating network design problem, and they uh, look very different from the internet or, or you know, from a water distribution grid because of the physical properties of electricity. Uh, and so you know, last week, we published a reading list on decentralized energy. And if it's something you are curious about, I would encourage you to, to go to our website, which is a16z.com, uh, or find me on Twitter. My name is Guy Willette. Uh, or talk to me afterwards, and I'll tell you all about it. Thank you.